is your first weekend as an intern and you are on backup schedule on a Saturday. And guess what? Your phone rings. And guess who's on the other side of the line? It's your favorite senior resident. He calls you up and he tells you, unfortunately, somebody called in sick, so you have to come into work. You come into work and your senior resident gives you your first case for the day. And it goes like this. A 50-year-old male with a past medical history of hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, presents with a sudden onset of shortness of breath. The shortness of breath was not associated with any chest pain, palpitations or syncope. He was recently involved in a sports injury and sustained a tibial fracture for which he underwent surgery. And he has been bedridden for the past 6 weeks. His wife called EMS and is brought into the hospital. Alright everybody, so based on the history you guys already had a very high suspicion for pulmonary embolism. However, you already know that physical examination is a very key component of any case. So let's go look at this patient's physical examination. Alright, so if you look at this patient's blood pressure on vital signs, you see a 80 over 55. So this is very important, mark this one down, alright, 80 over 55. Heart rate of 110 and the patient got a respiratory rate of 35 which is very high and the patient got a temperature of 100.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is technically fever greater than 100.4. Alright, now general examination you see that this patient is breathing fast. He looks like he's in respiratory distress. He's breathing heavily. Alright, now when you go into your respiratory system on uh, physical examination of the lungs you hear bilateral equal breath sounds. There's no wheezing. There's no crackles. Every Everything sounds clear but the guy is short of breath everything's clear on the lungs but he's short of breath this is a very important clue for you to remember all right next is cardiovascular exam where you got an s1 s2 is heard there's no rubs no gallops no murmurs so cardiovascular system is also perfectly fine and if you go to the lower extremity you see the guy has a right leg which is in a cast all right this is basically telling you the patient had a fracture for which is wearing a cast for the past six weeks all right guys so based on this physical examination i want you to connect the two now you have a physical examination that you're adding to your initial suspicion from this patient's case which was pulmonary embolism so you have pulmonary embolism i want you to see this as a spectrum it can go from very mild to very severe now this patient is in the severe because as you see the patient's got a very low blood pressure 80 over 55 what does this technically tell you this patient is in shock how do you define shock is a systolic blood pressure less than 90 or a mean arterial blood pressure less than 65 or a drop in a systolic blood pressure by more than 40 millimeters of mercury and if all of this lasts more than 15 minutes in the context of a suspected PE you are thinking of what what would you call this PE is it a benign PE or is it something more severe it is more severe because the patient is clearly in shock if the patient is in shock and suspected PE you call this a massive PE so the guy's got a massive PE oh my god you got called in on a Saturday and look at the admission that you've just received this is an important case because this patient can crash and die anytime so you have a patient who's hypotensive on the context of a suspected pulmonary embolism so here we're gonna call this as a massive pulmonary embolism so let's dive right into our labs and orders and assessment and plan because this patient is very critical so you're gonna do everything concurrently so now we dealing with the case of massive pulmonary embolism suspicion all right you haven't proven anything yet you are highly suspecting the patient's got a massive pulmonary embolism all right so you want to go into the labs and orders but again remember this patient is patient's got a low blood pressure you kind of want to do everything in a hand-to-hand -hand fashion all right you're going to place your labs and orders so let's just talk about the labs and orders that you are going to place in this patient so we'll get our regular labs you want to get your uh, cbc all right you want to see what the patient's hemoglobin Hemoglobin is. You want to see what the patient's platelet count is, right? So you want to know what the hemoglobin is. You want to know what the platelet count is. Maybe you want to know what the WBC count is as well because the patient did have a fever, right? All right. Next, you want to see the CMP because you're looking at the creatinine levels. You want to look at potassium. You want to look at magnesium as well as the rest of the 
complete metabolic panel as well all right pt ptt inr now this becomes a very important component of this patient's labs and orders all right so you want to get the patient's coagulation profile and then you want to get a troponin level and a bnp level i'm going to put a box around these two tests all right troponin and a bnp level is very important for you to get in this patient's case and also i want you to get an abg remember the patient is having respiratory distress all right apart from the abg you must have also also get a oxygen saturation so you want to get a pulse oximetry on this patient and in this patient in fact you will see that the patient is hypoxic on room air so you want to give the patient some amount of oxygen via nasal cannula face mask or a non rebreather but the patient is hypoxic on pulse oximetry if the patient is hypoxic on pulse oximetry next step you must get a arterial blood gas and in the arterial blood gas i want you to calculate something known as the aa gradient all right aa gradient basically telling you how much of oxygen there comes into the alveolus and how the amount of oxygen that's present in the blood you want to compare the two if there's a discrepancy that means the patient has an elevated aa gradient the normal aa gradient is about 5 to 10 all right so that's the normal aa gradient now how you calculate the aa gradient is covered in one of the shorter clips that we have on the channel so watch that and learn that however you must calculate an aa gradient in this patient by getting a arterial blood gas and then you must also get an ekg all right so ekg is important because the patient has had coronary artery disease before this could might as well be an acute mi so you must get an ekg to make sure there is no st segment elevation mi in this patient however when you do an ekg right and you're suspecting a patient has pulmonary embolism the most common finding that you would find is what is it the S1, Q3, T3 pattern? Absolutely not. It's not. It's not. The most common finding is in fact just sinus tachycardia. All right. So most common finding you will find is in fact going to be a sinus tachycardia. Okay. I'm just going to put ST for sinus tachycardia. Number two, you'll have non-specific ST or T wave changes, just non-specific changes. Or the big one, which we normally get is going to be S1, Q3, T3, and it looks like this. So you've got your labs and you've done your EKG. So again, important thing is, as I said, this patient has got a massive pulmonary embolism. So you want to get your basic lab work here, but let's go to the impression. Assessment and plan tells you a senior resident and your attending that you know what you're talking about. So your assessment plan is in fact going to be a massive pulmonary embolism a massive pe this is the highest it could get as i've already told you you're dealing with a patient with a massive pulmonary embolism right you need to work simultaneously you need your labs and orders being done but the patient is clearly hypotensive so let's dive right into the assessment and plan as well we're not done with the labs and orders but i want to do it concurrently all right so you suspect this patient's got what what is your assessment and plan the patient has a shortness of breath most likely secondary to a a massive pulmonary embolism it's a massive pe all right now when you're thinking of assessment and plan there's two parts to the story number one is you need to prove that this patient has pulmonary embolism number two is that you need to treat it are you gonna do which one first you need to you know that's the big decision that you have to make again sometimes you can go with one sometimes you can go with the other important thing is your clinical judgment and practice like a clinician you need to know what to do first all right so this patient massive pe let's put it has important uh, lab tests that you're going to do and the other one is going to be treatment all right treatment so let me go into treatment first is clear the patient is hypotensive we cannot let this person be hypotensive for too long so the patient has hypotensive what are you going to give this patient you want to give this guy fluid right you want to give him fluid so we are gonna put fluids now your choice of fluids normally is gonna be either normal saline or ringers lactate either one is fine all right normal saline or ringers lactate for volume expansion now if somebody asked you what type of shock is pulmonary embolism it is a type of obstructive shock right it's an obstructive shock if i drew the heart just really quick here right if this is the heart and this is your right ventricle and you guys know the right ventricle is supplying your pulmonary arteries it's gonna have 
your lungs right this is how the blood supply goes and now i'm telling you there's a patient has a massive pe meaning he's got a large clot sitting in here on the pulmonary artery all right so the patient's got a massive pe all right now my other question is you're going to give this guy fluids now one more thing just to uh, take a step back i want you to know that if a patient has a massive pulmonary embolism what's going to happen to your right ventricle is the pressure going to go up yes it is right because there's a lot of pressure here the pressure is going to go up your right ventricle is straining right it's straining straining it's going to have some dilation it's going to have some hypokinesis right your right ventricle is going to look so dilated so that is an important finding that you're going to see in a patient with massive pulmonary embolism so i want you to remember this reason is if you're going to give the patient fluid now you're telling me if i give fluid obviously you're giving it to the venous drainage isn't it you give fluid to the venous system which wherever you give it it could be through svc ivc eventually your svc and ivc are going to be coming to your right atrium right right atrium so if i gave a lot of fluid the fluid is going to come here accumulating your right ventricle and the fluid cannot go oh wow wait a second the fluid cannot go right it's an obstructive type of shock and now you're giving a ton of fluid to this patient and this is going to cause more strain in your right ventricle it's going to cause more dilation this is going to compromise on the blood flow to the ventricle you can cause an acute right ventricle infarction of your heart so this is an important concept so which means you must give fluid however you have to be cautious the ideal method to use you could give them about 500 ml or 1000 ml in short boluses all right that's what you're going to do you're going to give fluids but again you're not going to give like five liters at once the reason is you want to be cautious because this could cause worsening of the patient's presentation fine you got your fluids in now you gave the fluid and the blood pressure is not going up what are you going to do next well, obviously you're going to ask your senior what to do and your senior is going to say, well, start the patient on pressors. Oh, well, good. Thanks a lot for that, right? Pressors. Which pressors? There are like six pressors out there. So the choice of presser, what are you going to pick? Number one that you will pick is in fact going to be norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a very good presser that we use for pretty much any and every type of shock. So norepinephrine would have been a great guess to go with and norepinephrine works beautifully. All right. So norepinephrine will be your first choice to start in a patient with massive pulmonary embolism what about choice number two choice number two is gonna be dobutamine now if you guys recall what dobutamine is dobutamine is in fact a inotropic agent it causes beta 1 stimulation of your heart and this is gonna cause contraction right increase inotropy and that's gonna cause more fluid to get out of the heart so dobutamine is a good drug however if you recall is there a beta 2 receptor in your blood vessels in the peripheral system yes there is what does what what happens if you stimulate your beta 2 receptors you would cause vasodilation so a side effect of dobutamine is in fact causing vasodilation and can cause hypotension so what they normally recommend is you want to start norepinephrine and add on dobutamine to it either way i want to remember two important pressures that you will use is norepinephrine followed by dobutamine so you're done with giving fluids and pressure support for this patient so your next big question really is are you going to treat this patient are you going to treat this patient with anticoagulation the decision making of anticoagulation does not seem so hard important thing what you need to know is is the patient having any contraindication for anticoagulation it's that straightforward you want to see okay does this guy has a risk factor that i should not give him any anticoagulation the way you're going to assess it is by memorizing this table So you guys can go over this table and remember what the absolute and relative contraindications to anticoagulations are. Or you could follow this other scoring system that's present called Hasblad score. The Hasblad score is used in the context of DVTs, pulmonary embolism, also in atrial fibrillation. It's just a rough method to analyze and see what the risk of the patient's bleeding is. So based on this, you can actually assess and say, does the patient have a low risk of bleeding, a moderate risk of bleeding, or a high risk of bleeding? So it's very straightforward. The, the way you're going to decide is if the patient's got a bleeding risk or not. So what I'm going to do is, if the patient has, I'm going to put as low bleeding risk, 
a moderate bleeding risk and a high bleeding risk right so let's take care of the low bleeding risk person if you obviously know the patient has zero uh, bleeding risk at this point what are you going to do you can start the patient on heparin now the thing is this with regards to what kind of anticoagulation you want to give you actually in the hospital you have multiple choices all right if the patient is inpatient you have two choices more or less which is going to be a lower molecular weight heparin which is lovenox or you could use heparin the reason I'm choosing heparin here is heparin has a very short half-life and therefore because I am going to do one step further in this hemodynamically unstable patient so I want to use a drug that's going to be shorter lasting therefore if I can stop it I can be able to give the other medication faster so heparin is going to be my first choice in this patient now the dosing that you actually give for a patient as a loading dose for heparin is going to be 80 units per kilogram of of body weight all right followed by 18 units per kilogram of body weight per hour this is how your initial dosing of heparin is going to be and it's going to be a heparin drip and what you're going to be following is a ptt level how often are you going to be following this you're going to follow it every six hourly and what is your target a lot of people say 45 to 70 45 to 60 no what you're going to do is 1.5 times to 2.5 times patient's baseline all right whatever the patient's baseline is you want to fall between 1.5 to 2.5 of the patient's baseline because the baseline of the ptt could vary from patient to patient that's why i don't want to set target between 40 to 70 go based on 1.5 to 2.5 times the patient's baseline all right so you started the patient on a heparin drip all and fine but is this the treatment for breaking down a clot because the patient's got a massive pulmonary embolism no it isn't right however you're not going to waste time you must get a confirmatory test to figure out if you can give thrombolysis you're not going to give thrombolysis to a patient who you have not confirmed who has a pulmonary embolism without a confirmatory test you cannot give tpa so the question is how are you going to confirm this patient has a pe so the patient's got a heparin drip running good you're basically giving the patient anticoagulation all and well so your next step really becomes how are you going to identify if the patient's got a pulmonary embolism you have three options you the best choice is in fact going to be a ct angiography or you could do a vq scan or you could do something else i'll come to the something else in just a second your gold standard for diagnosis of pulmonary embolism is in fact going to be a ct angiography where you give contrast and you see the vasculature of the lungs and you can tell exactly where the clot is which is perfect and it's also very good for central pulmonary embolism it's very bad for the peripheral small clots that get shot into the lungs however vq scan which is a ventilation perfusion scan again it's most of the time it's preferred if the patient's got renal insufficiency because you know CT and geography you are giving contrast and there could be nephropathy from it so in patients with renal insufficiency we actually prefer a VQ scan all right so the thing is with this patient as I already said patient is hemodynamically unstable right you have him on presses running you may have even intubated this patient sometimes right so the patient is kind of more on the critical side so in this case the, it might be an instant where you cannot move the patient to get a CT angiography. However, if the patient was still fine, you have all these things and was safe, fine, you can go ahead and get a CT angio and you could prove the patient's got a PE. Or you could have done a pulmonary uh, VQ scan and prove that the patient's got a PE. What if you could not do both these tests? What are you going to do then? Oh my god, you're stuck now, aren't you? You cannot prove that this patient's got a pulmonary embolism. How are you going to give your TPA? This is where your echo comes into play. You could do a bedside echocardiograph and recall what I explained before about your right ventricle. Remember what your right ventricle was going through with all that strain in your pulmonary arteries? It was causing a right ventricular dilation. It was causing right ventricular hypokinesis. All right, and I want you guys to look up a specific sign known as McConnell sign. All right, McConnell 
sign, all right, which is an imaging, which is seen on echocardiography. It's a finding which is highly suggestive of pulmonary embolism. Essentially, what it shows is diffuse hypokinesis of the right ventricle. However, it does not affect your apex. It's just a cool fact, remember. It's not going to affect your management as an intern, all right. What you need to know is you can CT angiography, you could OVQ scan. If you can do both of them, you will do an echo. And essentially, what you're looking for is right heart strain. You will look at the right heart strain and the moment the right heart strain is present now it confirms all right the patient most likely got a massive pulmonary embolism all right so once you've confirmed it now you got to treat it so how are you going to treat it i'm going to wipe out my lab test that we just did here and what we're going to do is you are going to give this patient tpa but the guy is on heparin right what are you going to do stop the heparin Moment you confirm your pulmonary embolism, stop the heparin and give the patient TPA. And once you give the patient TPA, you expect the patient to improve. All right, let's go one round and say patient improved. Very good. What are you gonna do at that point? Restart the heparin. If the patient improved TPA, restart the heparin and continue the heparin drip monitoring your PTT. All right, very good. Now. If you gave TPA and the patient did not improve, he's still hemodynamically unstable, still requiring a lot of presser support, what are you going to do next? Let's try TPA again. Let's give him TPA again. You can try TPA for the second time. Fine, you gave TPA and the patient still doesn't improve. Now what options do you really have? Here you have two more options. Honestly speaking, the best treatment for a person with massive pulmonary embolism is in fact a surgical removal of the clot. All right, the best treatment is in fact going to be surgical embolectomy all right surgical embolectomy but if i'm talking about surgical embolectomy all i'm saying is you got a patient has to go for a uh, open heart surgery and you got to remove this clot this is a major surgery and not many hospitals are going to have the facility to do this in an acute setting like this patient so in those patients what you're going to do is catheter embolectomy okay catheter embolectomy there's multiple embolectomies that could be done, different types and whatnot, but you can't remember. Either you can go with a catheter and suck out this clot, or you can do a open heart surgery. So this is exactly how you're gonna treat a patient with massive pulmonary embolism. All right, just to recap what our assessment and plan was, the patient is in shock, what are you gonna do? Give the patient fluids, Give the patient pressors. Next, you wanna decide if you wanna give the patient anticoagulation or not. How are you gonna decide if you wanna do anticoagulation or not? You're gonna follow this table or this table. All right, so based on these tables, you're going to decide how much risk the patient has for bleeding. If the bleeding risk is very low, at this point, you're going to give the patient heparin. You're going to start the patient on a heparin drip, and your next step is to diagnose the presence of a pulmonary embolism. The gold standard test is CT angiography. The other option you have is a VQ scan. If you cannot move the patient because the patient is too unstable, what are you going to do? You're going to do a bedside echo. And what are you looking for? You're looking for a right heart strain if that's present all in well you have diagnosed a presence of a pe how are you going to treat at this point you will give the patient tpa but before giving tpa stop the heparin give tpa if the patient improves beautiful you've done well start the patient back on heparin and move on with your life if the patient does not improve you try tpa again or you could either send the patient for a surgical embolectomy or a catheter driven embolectomy all right guys i really hope that you guys learn this this is as simplified as possible that i could make it it is a big subject but if you know how to manage a patient in this exact manner you should be perfectly fine for your internship so we're done talking about a patient with low risk of bleeding it is pretty straightforward we already talked about how you're going to manage the patient however we still have to cover the patient's management when it is a very high risk of bleeding or the patient's got a moderate risk of bleeding high risk of bleeding is also going to be very straightforward patients coming with a massive pe you know that you need to give the patient anticoagulation but 
patients got a very high bleeding risk. What are you going to do? Clearly, you cannot give the patient heparin. You cannot give the patient uh, Lovenox. You cannot give the patient thrombolytics. So what options do you really have? All your options that you're going to have at this point is you want to uh, expedite diagnosing your PE as soon as possible. So you want to try to get this test done as soon as possible. Get your CTA. You could do your VQ scan or do a bedside echocardiography and look at the right ventricular stain. Either method, you must do your test as soon as possible and diagnose the presence of PE. Once you've diagnosed it, now you have pretty much only surgical options or placement of a IVC filter. So the way you're going to go once you diagnose it is placement of an IVC filter or the patient can go for either surgical embolectomy or a catheter driven embolectomy that's your only option that you're gonna have for your patient that's it you cannot give anticoagulation your options are pretty straight either put an IVC filter or do surgical which is gonna be surgical embolectomy or a catheter driven embolectomy so pretty straightforward right guys I mean you know how to man manage a patient if the patient had a very low risk of bleeding which is very complete you also know how to manage a patient with a high risk of bleeding what with moderate risk of bleeding this is pretty controversial you are gonna see a case by case basis again you're gonna measure risk versus benefit it's a gray area it's gonna be a decision making now important thing is I want you guys to remember how to manage how I've already told you about a low risk patient of bleeding with a massive pulmonary embolism and a high risk of bleeding how you're gonna manage this is the questions that you need to know the answers to yeah. Alright guys, so this concludes the case of a massive pulmonary embolism. This is more of a critical patient who is not going to come to the floor, but rather the patient is going to go to the medical ICU. And as an intern, you will have to know how to manage a patient in the medical ICU who is coming with a massive pulmonary embolism. And it's such a very, very hot topic. You must know. Alright guys, so the important other question that you need to know answers to with regards to how long the patient is going to be on anticoagulation and what is the patient going to go home on and this and that. You you will watch on the other section which is going to be pertaining to a submassive PE and low probability PE. It's all going to be covered in that area. So make sure you watch that video as well to get a complete understanding of pulmonary embolism. Do not miss anything. All right, guys. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. Please subscribe to our channel and pre hit the like button as well as the little bell button on the right hand corner so you get notifications when we make our next videos. Thank you for watching and see you guys on the next video. Yeah.